and things that are very case specific um, that would involve um, disclosing information that's very specific to your situation, then we would encourage folks to follow up um, with specific questions like that um, directly with Hera, either sending us an email or reaching out to us by phone on our intake line so that we can address those more specific questions. So um, please do uh, keep the questions that we're asking during the workshop to you know questions of a more general nature. Um, all right. And so with that, um, I think that we can begin. And so uh, this is uh, this presentation is um, part of the Ask a Lawyer presentation series um, in partnership with the Sacramento County Public Law Library. Um, and um, again, you know, if you type your questions into the chat box as you listen to the presentation, we will answer them uh, at the end of the presentation. And um, just please keep in mind that this present is for informational purposes only. It does not create an attorney-client relationship between the participants and either the Sacramento County Public Law Library or housing and economic rights advocates. And as we mentioned, more uh, you know, more information can be available after the presentation. You can reach out to us um, and ask your case-specific questions by email or uh, calling our intake line. Um, and we'll also send out these uh, PowerPoint slides so that folks have them um, as a reference after the presentation. All right, so here's what we'll cover today. Um, so, you know, the, the, the workshop is about solar panels and, and um, we'll talk about how to vet a contractor, um, what to look for when you're in the process of selecting a contractor to install solar panels or other home improvements, um, how to file a complaint against a contractor with the contractor state license board when issues arise, um, how to file a claim against the contractor's bond. Um, if there's uh, some sort of monetary loss um, that is incurred um, in the course of the home improvement contract. Um, how to choose what financing options make sense for you, um, what to look out for, so the pros and cons of different financing options for solar panels and home improvements. Um, how to file a complaint against a financing company or a bank. Um, we have the State Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, um, which licenses many uh, entities that offer home improvement financing. Um, and there's also the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, which oversees the, uh, which is a federal consumer protection agency um, that uh, oversees operations of larger financial institutions. Um, an overview of some of the key rights and protections that are available to you as consumers in a home improvement contract. Um, how to understand your solar system after installation and how Hera can help, generally speaking. All right, so here's our icebreaker question, folks. If you wouldn't mind just dropping your comments on this in the chat box, what do you worry about most when you think of getting repairs to your home? You know, when you're, when you're working on, on a home improvement project, thinking about hiring a cro contractor, if you wouldn't mind, please just dropping the concerns that come to mind, um, we would love to hear your thoughts. I see that, so chat is disabled. You can put it in the Q&A. Um, it, can, it can act as a, as a chat as well. So you can place them um, in that Q&A box. Yep, I see one uh, concern, having contract terms change during the performance of the contract. Yes, that's certainly something that we've seen in, uh, in cases uh, that have come through HERA. Um, in order to change the terms of the contract midway, um, a contractor is required to uh, complete a change order and obtain the homeowner's consent to the changes of the contract terms um, before the work is started. 
And so unless a contractor does follow through that change order process, they're, you know, they're technically not supposed to change the terms of the contract, um, you know, without first obtaining the homeowner's consent. So thank you for sharing that. Finding a responsible and professional contractor who will work in SF. Yes, definitely. The contractor vetting process is really important. I mean, I mean, that's the process by which you, you know, select the contractor that's going to do the work. And so you want to make sure, um, you know, as this commenter mentioned, that, um, you know, that they're responsible and professional. We'll talk about how to check a contractor's license detail on the contractor state license board website so that you can have a uh, better uh, understanding of, you know, what resources are out there um, for that really essential process of vetting the contractor before, you know, before you sign the home improvement contract, you know, before they even give you an estimate, you know, you, you definitely want to know that you're working with uh, an ethical and reputable professional. So um, thank you everyone for sharing your comments in the chat box. And um, let's see, will we address CPUC issues? So um, I see this question that's about the content of the, uh, of the workshop. We'll address some uh, of the California Public Utility Commission disclosures. Um, but again, if, um, there are, if you do have a question that's very case specific, um, we do encourage folks to reach out to us afterwards so that we can help you with your more uh, individualized concerns. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, all right, let's move on here. So what are some common issues that we see in the context of um, solar panel installations and home improvements in general? So misrepresentations, um, when homeowners are lied to or misled regarding the costs and benefits of solar or other home improvements um, and pressured into acting quickly without getting a chance to confirm that information. So, you know, when contractors show up at your door, maybe it's a cold call, maybe you haven't even reached out to them in the first place, maybe they're just knocking on your door asking if you're interested in installing solar panels or some other sort of home improvement. Um, and they may tell you, you know, that this is going to be the best thing ever, that the solar panels are going to cover all of your electricity expenses, um, and that you won't have to pay your utility provider for electricity ever again, or maybe even that the, your utility provider is going to be paying you for all the electricity that your solar panels produce. You know, those really sweeping promises um, can sound um, very desirable. You know, those benefits sound very desirable, um, but oftentimes um, those promises are not fulfilled. Um, and so it is important to, uh, to do your research and make sure that what the contractor is telling you is true um, make sure that you have a solid understanding of the, you know, the amount of energy that you've used in the past, for example, um, and how much energy the solar panels are going to produce so that you can verify that the promises are true in this example, you know, that the solar panels will indeed produce, you know, enough electricity to offset your usage. Um, and, you know, there, there are other types of misrepresentations that can come up as well, like, you know, the cost of the financing, how much you're going to have to pay every month if you're taking out a loan. Um, and, you know, there can be lots of different sorts of misrepresentations that that come up. So bottom line, it's just important to verify that the information is correct. Um, poor workmanship, solar panels not functioning or not connected, um, substandard installation, uh, damage to the property, um, and so we've seen, you know, for example, roofs that aren't installed correctly that, you know, there, there may be water damage to the property as a result of an improperly installed roof. Um, you know, the solar panels not functioning or not connected to the electrical grid um, and, you know, the incompleteness of, of that work, of course, you know, a, a homeowner can't get the benefit of the solar panel installation unless they're connected, interconnected to the electrical grid. Um, and so th we do see that issue come up. Fraudulent or predatory financing, um, you know, get us getting signed up for a loan or other programs without your consent. We have seen cases where, you know, folks come home and suddenly, you know, a home improvement has been installed. You know, there's, you know, a set of solar panels that, you know, they, they the homeowner didn't know they even signed up for. 
um, and then suddenly they're getting a huge bill that you know they they don't recognize. And so, you know, again, it's really important to vet the contractor that you work with. So I would suggest even before you invite them to your home to check things out and get an estimate, you want to make sure that the professional that you're working with is ethical and reputable. Um, and uh, seeking home repairs, um, some concerns, some warning signs of predatory or unfair financing. Um, the financing finds you instead of you finding the financing. You know, again, someone knocks on your door telling you about, you know, this great financing program that's available. Um, that can be a warning sign, you know, that it's a high pressure sale, um, that there's some sort of aggressive tactic going on, uh, not being provided a complete uh, copy of the contract um, before you sign the contract, um, being rushed to sign a contract, um, no clear information about the cost of repairs, so a lack of price information on the contract, um, you know, uh, lack of clarity as to who the end company financing the project is. Um, lack of clarity as to how payments will be made. Uh, the, I, you know, as someone mentioned earlier, terms getting changed without permission before negotiation. Some contractor warning signs. If the contractor does not give you their license number, um, if you look up the contractor's license detail and you see that there are prior complaints, um, that's also a red flag. You know that other folks have had problems with the contractor. Um, the contractor isn't willing to give you references. It's, you know, one tip that we would offer is when you're vetting a contractor, it's important to ask them for references of prior satisfied clients. And so if the contractor is unwilling or unable to provide references, you know, that's a warning sign. Um, you know, the contractor is difficult to reach. They're not answering your calls. They're not responding to your emails. You know, that's a sign of a potential lack of professionalism. Um, the contractor does not give you copies of the permits, you, you know, home improvements generally, you've got to get a permit in order to complete home improvements. And so if the contractor's not, either not obtaining or not giving you copies of the permits, you know, that's a problem. Also, uh, not being provided with a copy of the contract, homeowners have a right to receive a copy of the contract for home improvements before the work is started. And so if the contractor does not give a copy of the agreement, that is a problem. All right, um, vetting contractors generally. Talk to your friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers. Ask them if they know this contractor, if, if, you know, if they know anyone who has worked with a contractor, what was their experience like? Um, ask the contractor for references, like I mentioned, of, of uh, you know, prior clients that were satisfied with the work. Um, look at sites that you trust um, with ratings and reviews. Um, you know, Yelp, um, the Better Business Bureau, um, you know, websites like that that post ratings and reviews, um, get estimates. So after a con you obtain an estimate from one contractor, it's a good idea to get a few more, reach out to other contractors, see how the estimate sizes up. If it looks like the contractor is charging you a lot more than you know what the other estimates say, you know that might be a red flag. Um, and do your research um, about the contractor. Just, do a gen do, just even doing a general internet search to see the kind of, of reviews that people leave um, can be you know, can be enlightening. Um, also check their license detail on the contractor state license board website. You can go to cslb.ca.gov. Um, there are phone numbers uh, on this slide and um, the online lookup tool for a contractor license detail. You can learn a lot more uh, about, um, you know, the contractor's uh, history and, you know, whether there have been any, any complaints filed against the license. So here we go, this is a sample contractor license detail. Um, this is what a contractor license detail looks like on the contractor state license board website. But just keep in mind this here, this is not an actual contractor. Um, this information is just a made up contractor here um, just for the purpose of this uh, presentation. Um, and so there's a red hyperlink at the bottom, click here for complaint disclosure, if that red link appears on the license detail, that means that they've had complaints in the past. So you can click on that link on the bottom and learn a little bit more about what legal violations the contractor was cited for by the CSLB in the past. Also, if you're solicited by a home improvement salesperson, make sure that they are registered and listed as an employee of the contractor. So at the bottom of the license detail, 
there's a tab for personnel. And if the if you are solicited by a salesperson, that salesperson must be listed on the personnel list for the contractor on their license detail. Um, and the salesperson, you know, also must be a registered home improvement salesperson. There's also a separate tab to check the registration for a home improvement salesperson on the contractor state license board website. Okay, some additional tips for dealing with contractors, get a written contract, go over it with a lawyer if you need to, make sure that you understand the terms and conditions of the contract so that you know what your rights and responsibilities are. Um, for example, you know, if there's a promise that the solar panels are going to produce X amount of your energy and that's not in the contract, you know, follow up with the contractor. That was a promise, you know, that you are, that you're relying on in terms of moving forward with the agreement. And so that would be something that you would want to make sure is written in the contract itself. Any promises that were made to you verbally before you sign the contract. Um, keep in mind, it's unlawful for a contractor to ask for or accept more than 10% or $1,000 for a down payment, whichever is less. And so if your contractor is asking for a down payment in excess of those amounts, that's a red flag. Um, make payments contingent on completion if possible. Um, and so there may be phases of the contract, um, you know, especially if there are uh, multiple uh, items of improvement that are being completed. And so you, you do have the ability to negotiate, um, you know, uh, with the contractor for, uh, you know, contingencies um, that payment is contingent upon completion, you know, of uh, the phases of the project. Keep records, um, make, um, you know, make a file for all of your correspondence with the contractor, any documents like change orders, um, you know, emails, all of that. Records of payments and receipts as well. Make sure that you're keeping records of the entire transaction um, so that if anything comes up, you know, you have evidence to, you know, to support uh, your position as to what happened in the, in the course of the transaction. Make sure that the contractor pays its laborers, subcontractors, and materials suppliers. Uh, unpaid amounts can become mechanics liens. Um, contractors do have the right um, under California law to record a mechanics lien against a homeowner's property um, where uh, payment in full is not received for the work. Sometimes subcontractors can file those mechanics liens as well. And so it's important um, that all the, of the subcontractors are paid to avoid a mechanics lien. Um, and finally, do not make a final payment unless you are absolutely satisfied with the work don't sign a certificate of completion that says that the work is done before you've actually had a chance to see that the work is in fact complete to your satisfaction. Um, in, in some situations, it can be very difficult um, to, uh, to undo that, um, to undo that representation. You know, when you sign a certificate of completion, you're essentially, uh, attesting to the fact that the the work is done to your satisfaction and um, once you send that document it can be very difficult to sort of unravel that um, and you know convince the contractor the financer that you were not actually satisfied at the time that you signed the completion certificate um, okay some ooh, sorry about that some more common examples of contractor misconduct um, workmanship issues so substandard work um, it deviates from trade standards, general poor workmanship. So anytime that there's damage to the property, you know, or the work is not done right, if it's paint, you know, if the paint is chipping, peeling off right after it's applied, um, you know, windows are not properly sealed, um, you know, allowing uh, precipitation to intrude, you know, any sort of water damage that's resulting from um, poorly installed home improvements. Um, anything like that, uh, you know, would be substandard work. And it is unlawful for a contractor to perform um, substandard work um, under the contractor license law. Failing to connect the solar panels to the grid before accepting payment. Um, you know, before the contractor is paid for a solar panel installation, they really should be making sure that the solar panels are interconnected so that the homeowner is receiving the benefit of the contract. And your utility provider um, is required to provide a permission to operate 
um, before the solar panels, um, you know, can, can be interconnected and uh, start producing energy. So if a permission to operate document has not been provided by the utility, then that's a sign that you don't have permission to operate the solar panels and that they may not be interconnected yet. Abandoning the job before it's complete. Um, so just walking off of the job site without completing the work, um, especially if they've already been paid, um, you know, that is unlawful and, um, and could be cause for discipline uh, of the contractor. And persuading the consumer to sign a completion certificate before the work is complete. Um, we, we do see that uh, in some instances where, you know, the work isn't necessarily done. The, the contractor tells the homeowner, the consumer that they need to be paid and ask them to sign the completion certificate. Um, you know, no matter how much pressure the contractor is applying, it is important to just take a few deep breaths and, you know, ask to look at the work to make sure that it is completed to your satisfaction before you sign a legally binding document that says that the work is complete and that the contractor can be paid. That same sort of, you know, cooling off period suggestion applies to the signing of the contract itself. You know, if the contractor is just saying, let's go, let's sign this contract, it's gonna be great. You're going to receive all of these benefits. You're gonna save so much money. It is important to, you know, to take a few minutes, you know, take a few days um, to think about this. Um, you know, uh, you know, minutes would not be enough. Definitely take a few days to look at the contract, do some research, find out if what the contractor is telling you is true before you actually sign it. Um, you know, don't be, uh, don't feel like you have to um, agree to the contractor's pressure. A contract is voluntary. It is always your choice whether or not you want to sign a contract. And so it's important to make sure that you're making a, an informed decision um, before you sign a contract. License issues, employing unregistered salespeople. Um, so if a salesperson is unregistered, uh, you know, that's cause for discipline. Salespeople are supposed to be registered with the state license board. Using a name other than the one that appears on the license. For example, if the license detail that you look up on the contractor's license board says ABC Solar, but their business cards say 123 Solar, then they're going by a, a name that does not appear on their license, and that is cause for discipline. So make sure that the business name they're using on their marketing materials matches the name on the license detail. I'm going to pass it over to Natasha now. So some other common examples of contractor misconduct we see um, also involve the, you know, contract issues and mis misrepresentations that we discussed earlier um, in the presentation. So um, the first one I'm going to talk about is failing to provide the California Public Utilities Commission solar disclosure document. Um, and one of the participants raised this. Um, the CPUC is the government entity that regulates utilities. Um, and um, as a general matter, when you are a homeowner getting home improvement work, you are entitled to certain disclosures. So the contractor has to tell you certain information, um, you know, as required by law. And when it comes to solar panel work, um, there is a very specific disclosure document that is required to be provided to you. Um, it involves, um, it has very simple information. It requires um, the entire cost of the system. So not just what the contractor is being paid, but any fees, financing charges, um, that are being, um, you know, that are being on top of the total cost of the contract. And basically, it's the total price of what you're responsible to pay. Um, so that's required to be on there, as well as information about how to file complaints um, against the contractor license, um, as well as your right to cancel the contract within three days of entering into it. Um, and that's actually a extended to five days um, for people who are 65 years and older. Um, so those are all disclosures that um, you're required to be given um, before you sign anything um, with respect to solar panel work in California. So we do see sometimes that contractors are not giving that to people. Um, we also see contractors charging or accepting payment that is more than the contract price. Um, you know, sometimes it's added in, sometimes the bill won't match. Um, so that kind of thing does happen. Um, failing to disclose the finance charges associated with the transaction. So again, this is the interest. This is the loan fees. If a loan is taken out to pay the solar panels or some sort of other financing agreement is entered into to pay for the solar panels, then all of those charges need to be disclosed. Um, and sometimes we see that not happening. 
We also see misrepresentations um, with the home improvement contract. So sometimes that's price. Sometimes that's the estimated date of completion or other rights and no notices being omitted. Um, as well as we see misrepresentations um, with respect to the energy savings and the tax benefit. So sometimes you're being told, you know, you're not going to have to pay anything on the electrical bill anymore, or maybe it's going to be substantially reduced. Um, you're going to get a, you know, a big rebate or a tax refund or a tax credit, um, you know, for these energy efficient um, home improvements. Um, and so this is really common area of misrepresentations um, because some of it, some of it, right, you will sometimes get a benefit, but you have to kind of follow what they're saying to know um, exactly if it's true. A lot of times they are exaggerated um, or sometimes they promise people, you know, refunds who actually aren't eligible. Um, so, so things like that, um, you know, if you're going to get solar, you're going to get a $10,000 rebate, you know, when, when you file your taxes next. Um, and for many people, that is not true. Um, and so you kind of need to um, go more in depth to understand exactly, um, exactly what's going on with the contract. Um, increasing the price, adding more terms to the contract without a change order. Um, someone else on the on the Zoom also mentioned that um, sometimes, you know, they kind of change what's going on partway through. You've already signed something um, and all of a sudden um, there's been, a, you know, a big change um, in some way um, and they're not following the specific requirements. You know, the law has very specific requirements for how a change order like that um, needs to happen um, and, and the homeowner agreeing to it just like they would an initial contract. Um, and so and so that's, you know, a very um, important thing that sometimes doesn't happen. Again, the three day right to cancel, um, you know, you as a homeowner are supposed to be given this both verbally um, if they're you know, soliciting you at your home um, and written. You're supposed to be told that three days after signing, you can back out if you want. Um, and a lot of people, um, a lot of people aren't given that by the contractor. Um, you're also entitled to the contract in writing, um, which obviously um, a lot of people are not given as well. Um, you know, and I encourage you to request it if you're not given it. Um, but you are supposed to be supposed to be given that, um, and um, all the terms of the home improvement financing, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in a bit. Um, the specific financing aspects. Um, another aspect of this is, you know, this is these are specific examples of, you know, misconduct. It's not everything. Sometimes, you know, people will do something else, but it still can be considered misconduct. Um, and an important kind of thing to consider here is that all of this can also be um, targeted to certain communities. So um, this, you know, these kind of examples of misconduct can also be a form of discrimination if uh, a homeowner is being targeted based on their race or what languages they speak, or another protected trait. Um, so that's kind of another layer of that that we really do see in these home improvement and solar contracts is, um, you know, this, you know, failing to disclose, you know, all the contract terms, um, but also specific targeting of certain communities um, with, with that misconduct. So I think I'll pass it back to you, Daniel. Thanks, Natasha. All right. Um, so firing contractors and making complaints. So at a certain point, if the contractor is not, you know, uh, following through with deadlines or there are things that happen throughout the transaction that concern you, like, you know, the, uh, your, the contract terms uh, change, you know, without, without your knowledge or consent or um, the, you know, the contractor abandons the job. Um, you know, that it might be time to fire the contract and file a complaint against the contractor's license board. So a few tips for that scenario. Keep a clear line of communication. So if you're asking the contractor to come back and complete the work, you know, it's okay to make a phone call, but make sure that it's in writing too. Um, send a letter, you know, it could be an email if you're communicating with the contractor by email that expresses your concerns. You know, you understood that the contract was going to be completed by X date. It's still not done. You know, when do they expect to complete it? Are they coming back to complete the work? For example, you know, if abandonment is the is the issue at hand. Um, and review your contract, you know, make sure that, you know, your, um, that you have a clear understanding of what your rights and responsibilities are, you know, before emailing the contractor or following up with the contractor that can help you to 
uh, more clearly state what your concerns are. Like, for example, if the original contract price was, you know, 30,000 for the solar panels, and then the contractor called you and said, now it's going to be 50, but didn't send you something in writing, you know, you would want to make sure that um, you point to the to the terms of the contract when you're following up with the contractor um, and, you know, explaining why, you know, you're concerned about the price increase. You know, the in this case, you know, the contract originally said a price that's lower than the one that the contractor is saying now. Um, you may want to consult with a legal professional before firing the contractor um, because even if the contractor has not completed the work, for example, the contractor may be entitled to compensation for the work that they did um, under uh, you know principles of, of equity. They may not be entitled under the contract to be paid unless the work is done, but California law also says that a person is entitled to just compensation for, for work done. And so if the work that the contractor um, has done, you know, has some value, then they may be entitled to compensation. And that can be one of the concerns that come up when you fire a contractor um, before the work is complete. Um, and so, you know, it, it may be a, a good idea to speak with an attorney before you make that decision to go ahead and fire the contractor. Um, contact the contractor state license board. You can file an online complaint at the link below. In some situations, the contractor's license board is able to resolve the complaint through mediation without actually going through a formal investigation. So sometimes just filing a complaint with a license board can bring the contractor to the table and help to resolve things. All right, how to file a complaint with a contractor's license board. So just keep in mind, complaints involving a threat to public health and safety receive the highest priority. Uh, the CSLB is very inundated with complaints right now. So if you don't hear back immediately, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean the CSLB contractor state license board is not working on your complaint. They're just very busy. Um, make sure that if you, after you file a complaint, if you receive any correspondence from the CSLB that you um, follow up accordingly. Um, so that they continue working on your complaint. Failing to respond to notices from the CSLB, um, you know, with the information that they requested or what have you, failing to respond to those notices can result in your complaint being dismissed, um, you know, without, even though the CSLB would have otherwise pursued your complaint if you had responded to those notices. Um, you can file a complaint against licensed or unlicensed contractors. Um, there's a four-year time limit to file a complaint. Generally, the CSLB goes by four years from the date you sign the contract. In some situations, they'll go from four years from the date the work is complete. But as a rule of thumb, it's good to go from four years from the date you sign the contract for your time limit to file a complaint with the license board. Um, the intake and medi mediation representatives will follow up with you and, uh, and confirm that your complaint was received. Um, and they will also send a copy of the complaint to the mediation department, sends a copy of the complaint to the contractor um, and gives them an opportunity to resolve the complaint short of an investigation. Um, if the CSLB does determine that there is probable cause of a violation of the contractor's license law, then it will be assigned to an investigator. Um, and the investigator may, you know, interview you, the contractor, anyone else with relevant information. Um, in order to get into the investigation phase, it's important that you provide concrete evidence of the violations that you're that are alleged in the complaint. So photographs of uh, damage to the property, um, copies of the contract, you know, correspondence with the contractor, um, anything, any proof that you have. Um, to support your allegations of the violations. If there's no proof uh, at the, you know, at the outset of the complaint, you know, after that mediation period, the CSLB can dismiss it uh, for, you know, for lack of su sufficient evidence of a violation. And so when you're filing a CSLB complaint, it is a good idea to, um, you know, make sure that you've got all the supporting evidence and you can also reach out to HERA for assistance um, we, we certainly hope folks with filing CSLB complaints. If the CSLB is unable to settle your complaint, you may be referred to alternative dispute resolution. The CSLB does have an internal um, arbitration program. Keep in mind the CSLB has limited authority over unlicensed persons. Um, for a complaint, a complaint against an unlicensed contractor, the CSLB can issue a warning or a citation or the refer to the complaint for a district attorney. Um, but um, but their power is limited. They cannot. The CSLB cannot require an unlicensed person to make repairs 
or pay restitution. Um, and so those are some limitations um, on what the CSLB can do as to unlicensed contractors. Um, by contrast, uh, the violations of law by a licensed contractor can result in citation or charges that could lead to suspension or revocation of the contractor's license. So licensed contractors do have um, quite a bit to lose potentially if they um, do not uh, comply with a contractor's license law. Um, you know, they could have their license disciplined, pot potentially suspended or revoked. And so filing a complaint can be good leverage to resolve any dispute with a contractor. Um, citations can be up to $5,000 and orders of correction requiring the contractor to make repairs. Um, and if disciplinary action is taken, just keep in mind, um, generally the office of the attorney general is the, is the um, you know, they're the legal representation for the uh, CSLB. Um, but if the attorney general is taking action against the contractor, they do not represent you, the consumer. They're, they're counsel for the CSLB. So it's just important to keep that in mind. We're passing on to Natasha. So another option, um, if you're harmed, um, you know, by a contractor's conduct is to file a claim against the contractor's bond. Um, and this is basically a requirement that every contractor have a surety bond. Um, and it's, it's essentially insurance and it's required in order to be licensed in California. And it exists for homeowners who suffer a financial loss as a result of the contractor's wrongdoing. Um, and so as of right now, since the beginning of this year, um, the, the basically the policies are for $25,000 minimum uh, before it used to be $15,000 minimum. And that amount is in total. So um, if a homeowner three months ago, you know, had a financial loss due to this contractor and they file a claim, um, then that total amount that's even available is going to be reduced. Um, so, you know, it's helpful that there's more, but um, it's kind of a, you know, claim as soon as possible um, if this happens to you um, is kind of the best policy. Um, when you're filing a claim, the main things that the, the bond companies need to know is what did the contractor do that was illegal and how much financial loss was caused by that illegal conduct. Um, and they'd like to see documentation of these things. So, you know, as an example, you know, the contractor damaged my home when he performed substandard work and I had to pay another contractor to fix that damage. So you send in photos of the damage and a receipt for the remedial work. And you should be, um, you know, generally, you know, eligible for that for that bond. Um, the contractor, you know, another example is the contractor legally overcharged me. Right. And so then I had to end up paying more than I had initially agreed to. Um, you know, and so, you know, that's unlawful. So you could claim, you know, that difference and show them the receipts, you know, the bill and the original contract and send that into the bond company. Just like um, the complaints that Daniel was just speaking about, um, they do have time limits. These bond claims, um, you know, have very specific time limits that, um, you know, so if you wait too long, you may not be able to, you know, access this insurance policy. Um, the time limit specifically is two years after the end of the license period when the work happened. So in order to fi figure out that date, you have to go on the CSLB website um, and see, you know, what specific, you know, license period was, um, you know, what what was what the license period was when the work was performed on your home um, to then know, you know, what, what your time limit is. And if you have any questions about this, you know, this is something that we can definitely assist with, um, you know, if you're trying to figure out the deadline in your specific situation. Um, but, um, you know, once you figure out that time, you also can look at the bond details on that same website. They'll, you know, it lays out which policy was active when the work was performed on your home or when the, you know, when the harm occurred. Um, and it'll have the company and the contact information for who to send your bond claim to. Um, and again, this is a general rule of thumb, filing these kinds of claims as soon as possible to just make sure that you um, try to preserve, you know, your rights and access um, to those funds um, as soon as possible is really is really key here. To you, Daniel. Thanks, Natasha. All right. Electronic signatures. Often home improvement contracts and financing agreements are presented in electronic format. Um, Electronic signature programs are not ideal for reading long contracts with fine print, 
once you start signing, often what happens is the electronic signature program just sends you to the next signature block um, and does not necessarily uh, give the consumer a good opportunity to read through all of the terms. So it's really important that if you're asked to be, if you're asked to sign a contract on an electronic device, again, slow things down, ask for a hard copy to review before signing, you know, uh, think about it overnight, you know, look at the agreement, read it, think about it overnight, reach out to an attorney. If after you've read the contract thoroughly, you still do not understand, it is important to speak to someone who can help you understand it, whether that's a lawyer or a financial advisor, someone who's going to help you understand, you know, the legal jargon in the contract. And electronic signatures, you know, often it's just a few taps on a tablet screen, right? Um, it might not feel like it's a legally binding signature when you just do a few taps like that, but it is technically a legally binding signature that affects your legal rights and responsibilities. And so it's really important that before you sign a contract on an electronic device, you get a chance to read it beforehand. Um, and if the written contract does not contain the terms that you expected, don't sign it. Um, you know, follow with the contractor, express your concerns, you know, in writing and you know, make an effort to resolve that discrepancy before you actually sign the document. Um, and if the contractor is rushing you to sign immediately and you're saying, you know, I want some time, I want to think about it, can we meet next week or whatever, and the contractor is telling you no, they really want you to sign it right away, you're going to lose out on a really great opportunity, those are warning signs um, when you know, when someone is making a high pressure sale like that and telling you to, you know, take it or leave it, you have to sign right now to take advantage. That's, that's a warning sign that, you know, there's some sort of misrepresentation, it may be some sort of scam. And so be leery um, when you are um, being asked to, you know, being presented with a high pressure sales situation like that. Um, and and also, if you uh, if you do sign a contract electronically, typically electronic signature programs email a copy of the agreement to the uh, to the consumer after it's signed. And so, it's important to make sure that you double check your email records after you sign something electronically um, to make sure that you have received a, a copy of it. Um, and again, you know, the, I think the best rule of thumb here would to be to ask for a hard copy of the contract that you can read before you sign it electronically. All right, back to Natasha. So, um, for solar consumers specifically, I really want to highlight this document. Um, this is a solar consumer protection guide that was created by that same entity that regulates utility companies. Um, and there's a URL there and, you know, we'll send out the, the PowerPoint after this. Um, and I really encourage you to look at it. It breaks down your solar options, what's out there, the different ways you can obtain solar for your home, what could work best for you based on your needs and your affordability. Um, and it also has a lot of rights and protections um, documented in there. Um, and so I would really recommend um, that, you know, you look at it before you enter into any agreement for solar. <laughs> Um, and it's actually a requirement. Um, if you are, if your utility company is PG&E, Edison, um, San Diego Gas and Electric, um, and there are a couple other, you know, smaller ones that are also included in this requirement. Um, if you are being, you know, entering into a solar contract of any kind, they're required to give this to you. They're required to give you an opportunity to review it. Um, and they actually, you know, have to get you to sign it saying, yes, I received it. I reviewed it. I understand it. Um, you are also, you know, you entitled to a written hard copy of it, not an e electronic format. Um, and they're supposed to offer that to you and only give you an electronic format if um, if you request it. Um, obviously, those are things that often doesn't, don't happen. Um, but this is definitely a resource, um, a resource for you um, to to look at as as you're considering solar. You can go to the next slide, Daniel. Oftentimes, um, you know, people aren't given it. Um, and um, just as Daniel was saying, um, if a salesperson doesn't want you to read it, 
or they say, you know, we've talked about everything in there. You don't even have to look at it or, you know, um, let's sign sign now and you can review that later. Um, be wary of that um, because it's all good information in there. Um, and uh, the person, you know, pitching you the solar should want you to be aware of everything in that document. Um, you can go to the next slide. So um, I'm going to very briefly go over some basics um, on financing solar panels. Um, the document that I was just talking about has a lot of these details and the pros and cons for the different options. Um, but I'm just going to go over them very briefly. Um, you know, as you might think, solar panels are expensive. Um, a lot of people can't just pay out of pocket to get solar panels on their homes. Um, so there has to be some sort of, you know, financing mechanism to allow people to access these things. And so that's how, um, you know, these kind of financing arrangements have, have come up. Um, and there's a few main ones. The first one um, is loans, you know, traditional loans, um, on how, and that's how you buy the, buy the solar panels. Some are unsecured, some are secured. And that means, um, you know, uh, something that's unsecured isn't tied to the home at all. It's not tied to the property. Whereas something that's secured is secured by the home. It's like a mortgage you could get foreclosed on for not paying. Um, and then the other two big ones are solar leases um, and power purchase agreements. Um, and so I'm going to talk about them very briefly, um, but I want you to know that also, even though we're calling them solar loans, um, if you're doing other home improvement work, getting an AC installed, a new roof, um, all of this is still relevant to that. And especially if they give you a package deal with the solar, you know, installation, um, these are all, these are all things to understand. Um, so you could go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, like I said, um, the unsecured, you know, it's a loan. Um, there are monthly payments. You're paying interest. Um, there's usually, um, you know, a financing charge of some kind. Um, if it's unsecured, it's not barred against your house. So you can't get foreclosed on. Um, and, you know, you do purchase the panel. So at the end of it, you should own them. And um, you may be eligible for a tax credit if you do this. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail of this, but I will say that the tax benefits, um, you know, being exaggerated by a salesperson or a contractor is a very common, um, you know, misconception is a misrepresentation. Um, you know, you're told that you're going to get $17,000 back next year when you file your taxes, um, you know, no matter what. Um, and in the end, that doesn't happen. Um, and specifically, it often doesn't happen because either you don't owe that much in taxes or you don't know own any you don't owe anything in taxes right so if you don't owe anything in taxes or you don't owe much you're not going to benefit that much um but they really they kind of sell it as a you're going to get this cash back in your pocket um and it's kind of used as a as a tactic to try to get people into these arrangements um if you do owe you know in taxes then you will get a credit um so you know that does exist um, it's more um, it's more about overstating the benefit um, and who it applies to. Um, so secured PACE loans, um, they're called PACE loans. Um, they're called Property Assessed Clean Energy. And these are specifically ones that are more like traditional mortgages in that they're secured by the equity in the home. Um, so, you know, just like on your mortgage, if you don't pay, they can foreclose and force the sell of your property. Um, these are specifically, um, you know, kind of often hard for homeowners to keep up with uh, because they're paid in your property taxes. Um, and so, you know, if your property tax raises, often that means your mortgage payment gets raised um, or sometimes the mortgage company steps in to make these payments for you. Um, and, and that can be a real problem for homeowners um, and, and kind of keeping, keeping up with that. So usually, um, you know, when we, if we say if you, you, you have to take out a loan for home improvements, don't do one that's secured by a lien on your home. Um, you know, and obviously that's a generalization, but um, we've we've seen a lot of people who have been harmed by this kind of loan, um, and that's why that's why we bring it up to you now um, as you're kind of thinking thinking through your options. Um, and I think I think I'll move on. Just kind of looking at looking at the time. So leases. Um, and these are solar panel leases. These are basically like other leases, right? They're like leasing an apartment or a car in that you're making monthly payments um, to use the solar panels, um, but you're renting them. You do not own them um, and you do not necessarily have a right to keep them when the contract is over. Um, they usually take the form of fixed monthly payments 
um, and um, you're not guaranteed ownership of the panels, but oftentimes they put in there an option to purchase. And this means, you know, in the contract, there'll be a specific time where you can opt to purchase by paying an additional amount. And maybe that's the way that you can own the solar panels. But uh, there are a lot of misrepresentations in the sale of these leases um, that involve, you know, homeowners leave, you know, signing the contract thinking that they're going to own the panels at the end of it, no matter what. And that's often not the case. Um, so that's, you know, those are some kind of common things we see with leases, just like with the other, you know, all other, you know, solar panel situations, um, you, there are pros and cons, right? You you might be able to save money on your utility bills, um, but in general, you know, you want to make sure that what you're being told is accurate and that it's not being exaggerated how much you're going to benefit. Um, you can go on to the next slide. This is um, very similar to power purchase agreements, um, which is um, instead you are paying a monthly payment um, for the electricity itself. So they come and install solar panels, but you're not renting the solar panels, you're actually purchasing the power that they're producing. Um, and you know, with th these specifically, you're paying at a specific price rate, you're not doing a specific monthly payment. And so when that price rate increases, you have to be aware of that in the contract, right? It goes back to the best practices of reviewing and understanding the contract and being aware of payments that might change in the future um, you know, on all of these, all of these agreements. Um, again, you're not guaranteed. You're not guaranteed um, ownership, even if there's an option in there, because you're probably going to have to pay more. And there's a specific time where you'll have to opt opt for it. Um, so we can we can move on. And if anyone has any uh, follow up questions for these, we can we can go in more detail. I know I'm going fast. All right. So best practices in any of these financing scenarios: ask questions about the financing. Make sure you understand what your payment obligations are whether the payment obligations change, like Natasha mentioned, whether there's an increase in the cost of electricity in a power purchase agreement or for you know, an unsecured solar loan, if the monthly rate that they're telling you you're paying monthly is just an introductory rate, um, you know, and after a certain amount of time, it increases. You know, Make sure that you um, take the time to read your contract so you can understand all of those things, have an attorney help you understand, the, go through the contract if you are having a hard time understanding it. Don't sign anything the same day, you know, take take some time, think about it overnight, um, you know, make sure you have the time to read through everything before you make a decision. Uh, get, you know, obtain alternative estimates and check out alternative si financing. See if you're eligible for a loan from, you know, a lo local bank or credit union, compare the loan terms and see what is going to be the most economically viable option for you. You have a right to a copy of all agreements in the language in the, which the salesperson spoke to you, if it's one of the five primary languages in California. Um, you uh, also have a right to receive the California Public Utility Commission solar disclosure document that, um, and a list of the total cost for the solar system. Three-day right to cancel um, for seniors um, 65 and up. It's a five-day right to cancel. And um, a solar consumer protection guide for PG&E um, Southern California Edison or um, San Diego Gas and Electric customers, you're entitled to that additional solar consumer protection guide. If you have a dispute about the financing, you can file a complaint with the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Um, you might be also able to file a complaint with the Consumer Protection Bureau. Um, CFPB, uh, that's the federal agency, they have jurisdiction over, um, or you know, they have authority over larger institutions um, like you know big banks and and things like that. And so, um, you uh, you can file a complaint with the CFPB or the DFPI. Again, the DFPI, Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, they license um, PACE administrators. Um, you know, the property assessed clean energy. Uh, program administrators, as well as the contractors that solicit PACE financing, um, they all have to be uh, licensed with the uh, the DFPI, and so you could also file a complaint um, against those entities with DFPI. Um, there are also other financing options. Um, there are HUD loans, the FHA um, uh, 203K loan, and USDA, um, United States Department of Agriculture, Rural Home Repair Loans. Um, private financing options as well, like a refinance, um, a second mortgage, 
a HELOC or a reverse mortgage. Um, one thing to keep in mind for reverse mortgages is that if you do use a reverse mortgage to finance home improvements, um, it can be difficult for the home to be passed on to um, you know, your heirs, folks who you would want to receive the property when you pass on. Um, and that's because the balance of a rever reverse mortgage when the homeowner passes away becomes due and payable. And it is often difficult um, for the heirs, the folks who are entitled to receive the property to pay the loan off or um, sell the property in time uh, to avoid a foreclosure by the reverse mortgage lender. So um, reverse mortgages do have some uh, difficulties in terms of being able to pass the home along uh, after the homeowner passes away. There are Can also programs. Add, sorry, Dan. Yes. I just want to add something on the last one. So with all of these, um, the main, the, I guess the main 